Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we are joined by one of the most accomplished musicians in music today. This gentleman has been on the scene for over 40 years and has worked with many greats from Dizzy Gillespie to Leonard Skinner, Jethro Tull, Ron Carter, and Victor Wooten, to name a few. He is a bassist and educator. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, Mr. Steve Bailey. Welcome, sir. Wow. Th thank you, uh, Preston. I... I uh... I remember some of those artists I work with. And some of them were a while back. Uh, so yeah, like, yeah, you've had a quite, wow. quite an illustrious career. But man, I wanted to get into this with you and talk about your career. Now, I understand that you're from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. I am, and it's where I'm sitting at this moment. Wow. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your humble beginnings. You know, your background and family, and because uh, I know that you started playing bass at 12. But just curious to know a little bit more. Uh, you know, just prior to that. Well, well, basically, uh, Preston, um, the bass interrupted my professional surfing career. And mm -hmm. back in the 70s, there was no such thing as a professional surfing career, but we all wanted to be the best. And yeah, and surprisingly, some of the, the guys I grew up with ended up being pro surfers through that era. But but I fell in love with the bass. Um, I mean, I, I was just a normal kid before that happened, surfing and hanging out and, and some sports. Uh, and and uh, uh, but the bass and, and I played trombone. I played trombone in the in the marching band in the in the high school band. But I remember this drummer I know, still know, um, um, and we still work together occasionally. He just came to me one day and said, "Hey, you, do you ever would you consider playing bass in our band?" And I I was like, it never even occurred to me. Um, he said, "We need a bass player," and basically you you look cool you have long hair and uh, <laughs> we're a rock band and so i went over there not knowing what to expect they had a tuned down guitar I, I certainly didn't have an instrument a tuned down guitar and he showed me uh three notes i now know them as c sharp b and a on mm -hmm. the e string and showed me some rhythms to play and uh and uh and then we played um all along the watchtower for about an hour and a half straight just me playing those three notes and finding different ways to use them with with this finger and that finger and i left that day with a blister on both fingertips yeah and i, and I was a bass player i was hooked and, and we wow. had a gig this this goes back to some bass player joke i'm sure but mm -hmm. our first gig was two weeks later and uh oh my gosh so uh, i uh, <laughs> I went, wow, really? Okay. Uh, again, the bass is, and the, the beauty is the trombone is it kind of in the same register. And, and I was able to transfer all the academic stuff that I learned on trombone, the reading and, and rhythms and stuff like that. I was able to switch those over to bass and then all bets were off. I, I stopped. I still surfed quite a bit with my buddies, but I stopped getting up at four in the morning to go surfing. And I, I kept getting up at four in the morning, but that was to practice the bass. So that pretty much became your focus at that point, playing that bass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I just fell in love uh, literally overnight and um, I, I didn't know what to listen to. And all of that came later and, and getting some good instruction from uh, a couple people. Um, uh, that were key in my life um, as far as as making advancements and choosing colleges and what music to listen to and some technical things. They all uh, one taught at a local college here and was a North Texas graduate, and the other taught at a Marion High School, which is a little town not far from here, Austin B. King, and he was a a huge influence on me on the upright bass when I eventually started playing that. Yeah. Now tell me, uh, I guess a situation, I read a story uh, that you switched to fretless because you actually backed your, what, your car, your Toyota over your, your base. And you even know. That <laughs> how did that happen, it? man? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did that. Uh, you really want to go there, right? Because I, I really want to go there. <laughs> I, I, I've got one part of that story you may not know, but yeah, I did. Uh, we were it was right before I went to college the summer before, and I was playing this local gig up in North Myrtle beach. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, we were doing Bee Gees tunes and top 40 at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the keyboard player was riding home with me that night. Um, I was 17 and, uh, 
and I um, were backing up. We loaded up, we we're backing up, and I felt this kind of like I was backing over one of those little uh, short curb. And I'm thinking, I'm in a parking lot, there's no curb. But I, I couldn't, I, I was 17, I just pushed over it. And then as you're backing up the periphery over the hood, I, my gig bag started to come into focus. And I realized at that moment that I just backed over my new, basically almost new, um, I'd had it about nine or 10 months, uh, Stuart Spector fretted bass. And um, uh, yeah, that was, that was traumatic. I, I will say this, whenever, to anybody who backs over their instrument, when you pick up the case or the gig bag, and it, off the parking lot or wherever it was, and it sounds like a rain stick, you know, mm. stuff floating from the headstock all down through the gig bag, like a percussion instrument, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, and that really, because uh, I didn't have a, a, another bass except a fretless, and uh, I remember the next night on after, I mean, it's traumatic for a kid to do anything like that. But the next night I took my fretless bass and I remember the same piano player that was in the car with me. I looked over at him and he was going like this as I was playing, making that bass face, as we call it. And mm -hmm. uh, and and I thought it was because he was really getting into the music, but it turned out it, it, he told me it was because he couldn't tell what the root was. My intonation was so bad. Oh, wow. And that's when I set about to, to uh, learn to play it in tune while my while my fretted bass was off at Stuart Spector's in New York being repaired. Um, I started, I, I just had a fretless bass to play all day. And, uh, and so began, I, 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 I loved it because I, I mean, I'd heard Jocko and I already had one, but, but I, I was just in a position like most bass players, we put that fretless bass down when uh when the heat gets a little hot in the kitchen um uh it, it's you know but then i had no choice so i said i gotta learn to play this thing in tune and i've got to learn to play it well enough to play a top 40 gig and um and i set about to do that and I, that was in 19 um summer of 78 and I'm still trying to figure out how to play it in tune. So it, it started a journey that's continued, you know, 44 years since that that summer. That's amazing. Now, uh, I understand that you got interested in playing the upright and when you heard Chick Corea and Stanley Clark, I believe it was what, Light as a Feather? Well, yeah, yeah, that, that, um, yeah. Uh, the, the Jack Austin, who was a guitarist, <laughs> who graduated from North Texas, came here to teach music theory at this community college. And, mm -hmm. and somebody told me, if you want to learn uh, the instrument or about music, you need to go to Jack Austin. And I did. In one of the, our first lessons, he said, you need to listen. If you want to really learn your instrument, you, listen to some jazz. And, and I said, any recommendations? Um, I didn't know. Uh, what jazz was really I, I, I he said yeah go go to the record bar which was a local record store and and get any album by chick korea and i'm thinking okay uh chick korea i i didn't even know it was a a male i for some <laughs> reason just the the bizarre name made right. me think it, it might have i didn't know so anyway i got this album and uh it was called light as a feather and I came home and I put it on the turntable, yes. And uh, and I I heard Stanley Clark playing upright bass, and and I didn't know that that was amazing. I just thought that was jazz, and that was the way it was to be played because I'd never heard anybody play an upright bass except um, for Richard Maloof on the Lawrence Welk show. Whenever uh, I started to notice it, mm -hmm. like what's that thing? He plays mm -hmm. tuba. And Richard plays uh, that big bass, and he plays electric bass. So I would watch Lawrence Welk with my mom. Yeah, sorry, I did do that, and um, uh, and and later got to teach with Richard at uh, Bass Institute of Technology in in Hollywood. But but yes, that that was my introduction to the upright, and uh, and then right after that, I got to hear uh, Andy Simpkins 
who's a great jazz bass player, no longer with us, um, play with George Shearing at a local mm -hmm. uh, convention center here. Mm -hmm. And that just sealed the deal. That's when I knew I had to have one. And within sure. weeks, uh, we had found one in Charleston, South Carolina, and my dad had uh, uh, brought it home one day. I still remember seeing the van pull up in the driveway. I was so excited about it, his old blue van. And I knew that there was a, a, a little base inside, uh, upright base. And that, that, that began then. But yeah, Stanley messed me up. Uh, and I, I joke with him about this now. I said, man, when you play that, that brrrr on yeah. the bass, I go, man, I spent uh, months trying to figure out a fingering on that, slowing the, the turntable down to uh, uh, seven, how, however the slowest you could go, trying to, it sounds like a chromatic scale. So I was working on this, brrrr, brrrr, um, let, let's see, I've got all these crazy cameras. You can see from here, but my yeah. hand, we're, we're just trying to, to figure this out, how he was doing it with the right hand and how he was fingering it um, with the left hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I could come up with was a chromatic scale, and I practiced it with a metronome. And then later he was laughing. I said, how do you finger that lick? And, and uh, uh, he, he, well, actually it wasn't. It, I discovered this watching uh, educational television with my mom when Chick Corea was on there. And he just had one finger and he was just just sliding it up and down and trilling with his right hand. And I went, man, I worked for months. On that <laughs> but it was integral to the way I learned. You know, I back in that day, there were no videos. There was no YouTube. Uh, there was no recordings that you could watch at all unless they were on the three networks or, or ETV public broadcasting and fortunately Chick Corea was on there and I got to see Stanley play maybe in 70 uh, maybe that was 76 somewhere in there right after light as a feather came out and um, yeah but he laughs about it now he goes you did all that work <laughs> <laughs> you know it's amazing you know they, they put out some some great stuff I mean with his self-titled uh, recording and of course school days which is legendary and uh stuff that returns forever made still my favorite tune by them it's probably no mystery oh yeah i, I love that one yeah and of course romantic warrior but they they were uh the trailblazers tell me about jocko how did you discover jocko what was your perception steve when you first heard him play for the first time because i've talked to bass players and they said preston when i first heard his uh debut album you know they're just talking about portrait of tracy and you know, Donna Lee and just like, is that two or three bass players or they were just confused? What was your perception of him when you first heard him? I wish I could say it was mind blowing, but once again, ignorance is bliss. And, and somebody said, you got to check this, And I can't even remember who it was. You got to check this out. And I had just heard, um, uh, weather report, um, uh, be -do 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 uh why am i blanking on that this is um i just heard the melody being played in artificial harmonics and i wasn't sure what that was come about birdland birdland yeah, yeah by process of elimination i came up with that it had to be the bass player and then yeah. right about that time somebody said yeah that's jocko check out this album and um and i heard portrait of tracy obviously the first track i got the album and put it on and listen to it. And I wanna say my mind was blown, but I didn't have anything to compare it to other than Stanley Clark at that point, yeah. or, or Leonard Skinner, who I was listening to, or Jethro Tull or Jimi Hendrix. Those were the, my other bands. And, and it was certainly uh, light years beyond that. And, and the more I dug into it, when I tried to figure out some of the stuff, and I, Donna Lee just caught my mind, uh, caught my ear, and and I had a real book at that point, and and it was written out in the real book. It never occurred to me that Jocko didn't write Donna Lee until I actually read who the composer was and realized that it was uh, been around for a long time by Charlie Parker. But but then I I, I just I, that was inspiration for me. And and fortunately, Jack Austin was a classical guitarist, and I asked him about those artificial harmonics and how is he getting all those chime sounds and he showed me the open harmonics and then he showed me the classical way 
of, uh, of doing artificial harmonics, which Jocko did, did some of. Um, and, but little did I know it was in no way resembled how Jocko did it. It was a completely different technique. And, and once again, ignorance is bliss. I started working on that and one thing led to another. And I had done shortly after that, a solo bass version, which I still have and may release it someday. But um, Portrait of Tracy inspired me to do Crystal Silence by mm. Chick Corea. Mm -hmm. doo -doo. And, and it's just beautiful melody. And I worked out artificial harmonics and, and uh, eventually I'd sent it to college to get accepted to North Texas. I sent it to Berkeley and, and North Texas. And, and the people at North Texas uh, were, were wondering how I multi-tracked um, the, the harmonics. And, and uh, I, I just told them I didn't. And I think they thought I was lying. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that was, a, but later on, and maybe we'll get into this on the, on the, uh, another Jocko episode, but it, it, it really brought about some funny things about five years later when I did get to know Jocko quite well. And we compared notes and, and I had the unmitigated, uh, ignorant green audacity to actually argue, uh, with Jocko about the right way to play artificial harmonics. There's a funny story that you, uh, in the documentary on Jocko Pastorius, it's like the very end you tell a story about, I think it was Teen Town, a Teen Town story. I love that one. I was listening to that uh, recently. Yeah. You know. uh, I mean, the sad part of that, and I love the, 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 uh, the documentary that, that Robert did. I mean, yeah. and he did it so well. And my interview was two hours long and, and there were wow. maybe a hundred interviews that, that were that long. They had hundreds of hours of, of stuff to choose from. And, and I was kind of bummed. Well, I'm not bummed that some of my other stories didn't get on there, but I was a little bit bummed that the punchline from that story came afterwards and they didn't put it in the documentary. So mm -hmm. just to briefly set up the scenario, I was at Jocko's house. This was after we met and he kind of took me under his wing in a little way, or we just hung out or, you know, he'd call me at seven in the morning, man, say, come up to the house and, and hang. And I would, I'd skip school. I was at University of Miami by that time and I would just skip classes. But, but one time we, and we would play together and he would often would play drums and I would play bass and we'd just goof around and, and I didn't, it was so surreal. I didn't realize how amazing it was. And mm -hmm. I look back on it. So I'm sitting there I'm playing, we're playing in C and I'm just kind of playing this funk groove and Jocko's playing drums. And all of a sudden he goes into, you know, that, that teen town groove, which I had heard. And uh, he looks over at me and he says, Steve, play, play teen town. And while he's playing, and I just kept playing what I was playing, and finally he looks at me and he stops playing. He goes, "Man, let's play Teen Town." And and there's a, he's sitting right beside me, and he's about as tall as me sitting on the drum stool as me standing up. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, uh, "I said, Jocko, I, I said, I, I I'm sorry, I don't know Teen Town, and in fact, <laughs> I don't know any of your songs." Um, and uh, and he just kind of looked at me puzzled. And he stood up and I thought, and this is the line that they said got a lot of laughs, so they left it in there. In my mind, I thought, oh my God, I'm about to get my ass whipped by Jocko because I don't know Teen Town. And he lunged at me only to hug me. And he pulled me close and he, and he held me. And if you knew Jocko, you would understand this. If you don't know Jocko, it makes no sense, um, or, or unless you, you've read a lot about him. But he hugged me, and, and he said, man, he goes, that's why I love inviting you up to my house. He goes, because it's not like playing in front of a mirror. Mm. And that's the way he felt. That, that was what they left out. That was the beautiful lesson, which wow. is the reason I've never learned Teen Town in my life. When Jocko hugs me and says the reason he loves to play with me um or have me up at his house i don't think he really loved to play with me but 
but had me up to the house to hang and, and play was because I did not sound like him. It was not like playing in front of a mirror because everybody in South Florida, this was Jocko's heyday. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody took the frets off the jazz bass. Everybody was playing fretless and, and everybody was trying to emulate Jocko. And I was just kind of looking, looking for my own, um, crazy thing, you know? And, uh, and that's the punchline to me is that, I learned then, I, I, I accidentally could have learned Teen Town and been playing it for him. Or, uh, and, and I did say I did learn Donna Lee off the album. I said, but that's because it was in the real book. <laughs> and he laughed at that. <laughs> but uh, that's so funny. I, 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 that was a big lesson for me. It's like, take the inspiration from somebody like Jocko. Um, but there's no reason when the very person who created the music says he digs me because I don't know his songs, I, I'm led to uh, a logical conclusion there, which is pretty obvious. And I've heard it happen with Victor at camp. You know, we'll be sitting there with 60 bass players and they all get to play a little something as our introductory uh, 60 second auditions, we call it. And one person goes into sex in a pan and um, expecting Victor just to go nuts and I, I and Victor didn't he said that was nice but later on I told him I said if you really want to get Victor's attention if that's that important to you take sex in a pan and make it your version mm. not Victor's version because you're never you'll never play that version you'll never play it as well as Victor has played it a million times I said but if you come up with something unique to bring to that piece of music then you'll get Victor's attention. And, uh, exactly. and sure enough, by the end of camp, he had worked out a, a version and the desired result. Vic was in the back of the, this big room where we rehearse and have concerts. And, and I said, go ahead, play it, play what you started. And, and he started playing Sex in the Pan, this cool, like completely different time signature and, and different phrasing. And all of a sudden Vic is like, whoa, yeah. And comes walking up to check it out. Another to me, another powerful lesson in, in, um, in being an individual, it's okay yeah. to copy and, and that's all good, but, uh, don't expect to impress the people that you, maybe the people you want to impress, but not mm -hmm. the people you need to impress right. um, to with that kind of, uh, behavior. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Steve, we talked a little bit or you brought up uh, University of Miami. And I think about that place. So many great musicians, you know, Jocko, of course, Pat Metheny, Bruce Hornsby, Hiram Bullock. What was that period like for you there? And uh, I'm sure you got a chance to, you know, work with or befriend a lot of great musicians uh, who are around today. Well, uh, let, let me if, if you don't mind, uh, let me preface it a little bit by saying I was at another great school before Miami, North Texas State, where equally amount of great musicians had come out of at that time mark johnson lyle mays yeah you know uh uh and all the big bands of buddy rich and woody herman and and all of those were getting filled with players from north texas and university of miami but here was my problem with north texas after being there i realized that they did not have a jazz bass teacher and they certainly did not treat the electric bass like a legitimate instrument and I came and I played double bass and, and ironically, my scholarship there was a classical scholarship playing repertoire and playing the standard Kusevitskys and, and, and all, all that came with, with that, but I, I really wanted to play jazz and, and they didn't have anything at the time for bass players. Now they have a wonderful uh, uh, double bass jazz instructor, Lynn Seaton there, mm -hmm. but there was nobody there. So I checked who are the other two places or who are the other places that 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 treat the electric bass as a legitimate instrument and it came down to university of miami in berkeley mm. and me being a beach boy uh and liking warm weather um miami seemed like a, a a logical conclusion and i called him up i talked to don kaufman who is still a good friend of mine to this day i'll probably talk to him today and told him I was a young bass player at North Texas and, and was considering coming to Miami. I made a tape, sent it, 
things worked out the next semester i was in miami and and finally taking electric bass lessons as well as double bass but mm -hmm. focusing on more contemporary music and it was amazing and so many between north texas and university of miami so many people um that i went to school with i still work with i still do last week i was in austin texas doing a session with the very first drummer that I played with at North Texas, Ray Brink. Wow. And we're still working together. Check this out on Monday and Tuesday. And, and I think right behind me in that picture up there, I'm not sure who that may be Dorico, but, but next week we're playing with, with Greg Bissonette. Oh yeah. And, and Greg uh, is, is on our new album. And Greg and I, he was the second drummer I played with at North Texas. So we're still working together. We're just on the phone with Andy Timmons, a great guitar player who, who I brought from University of Miami to make a rock record. And he ended up living in Los Angeles. So all of these intertwined relationships that came from college. And I, I tell students about it all the time. Your career is built in college if you go mm -hmm. to the right colleges. And uh, uh, so... I ended up at University of Miami, loving the environment, the music down there. It was tough. You know, I got my butt kicked. Um, I got fired from just the right gigs um, to that really helped my career. It's funny yeah. you know, when people say getting fired can actually be a career booster. Um, I'm living proof of that, that mm -hmm. all the good gigs I came that I got came from disappointment um, and what I learned from being disappointed. And I guess maybe that's, that's really the lesson in that. How do we handle it? What do we do as a result? Do we give up or do we fight harder and learn yeah. some stuff? That's but beautiful. I love Miami. I, I still love University of Miami, still a great school. It's ironic that I would be working at Berkeley after, you know, all of that history. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, but it is, what it that's is great. that's great steve now eventually i guess you made your move uh to new york and you were playing with some heavyweights uh early in your career uh especially dizzy gillespie what was it like working with him well i mean that that uh, at university of miami i also got this great gig backing up name artists every other week at this club and i played jazz five nights a week at a club mm -hmm. not for weeks not for months but for two and a half years straight wow. Every night, I mean, it was insane. I tell people that that kind of gig existed then, but but I, I was in the right place at the right time with the right skill sets, and I got that gig, and uh, and and we backed up everybody from Ernestine Anderson to Lou Tobacken to to Al Gray and Buddy Tate, Mark Murphy. I mean, the list goes on and on. And one of those people was this new guy from Cuba that had defected to the United States named Paquito de Rivera. Oh, yes. He was our guest a couple of times and and we had a good time making music. And at the end of uh, almost my last semester, I got a phone call from him asking if I wanted to move to New York uh, to join his band, make a record in San Francisco. He was on Columbia Records. He yeah. already had one or two albums out and was really highly acclaimed. And we're going to tour Europe. Mm. Duh. <laughs> and uh, so within a couple of weeks, I was on my way um, to New York City to join his band. And we did do that summer tour. And during that summer tour, we played the North Sea Jazz Festival. And that's where I met Dizzy Gillespie. And, and wow. he, he met me. Uh, he heard me play with Paquito. And then we hung out some. And then and back in that day, th those folks would talk with each other. Uh, they, like, Dizzy's not going to just take another person's musician like Paquito. So they had a discussion, which is kind of cool when you think about it. I came from that era where Art Blakey would talk to whomever and say, you know, I, I, wa I want your tenor player, you know, let's, let's negotiate or, or is this cool or, or, you know, they asked permission and, right. and uh, Dizzy did that with Paquito and Paquito was like, yeah, man, absolutely. You know, he knew the kind of money Dizzy paid, which uh, this is an aside, but Dizzy was the most generous jazz frontman of that era. Wow. And, and when I walked into the band, my first day of rehearsal, Hank Jones was there, 
James Moody was there, mm -hmm. and and uh, and um, and Dizzy was so generous. He was paying me the same amount that he was paying them, and I thought, man, I am on easy street now. My <laughs> life is it's all it's it's all cake and icing from here. Much I found out differently, but. I will say that that Dizzy was was taught me so much and he could do it in ways that that were so kind and benevolent. And then there were some other ways uh, that were equally as effective that only he knew how to uh, to do as an educator. His brand of education was was not something that that I would even recommend, um, but but it was very effective and I appreciated it. Yeah, I mean, names like Hank Jones and James Moody. I mean, initially playing with artists like that early in your career, I'm sure, you know, you're all, you're ready. Your chops are there. But were you a little nervous or starstruck, Steve? Like, man, this is Dizzy Gillespie and Hank Jones. I mean, what was your initial reaction when you were playing with those guys like the first day? Uh, imposter syndrome. Like, what am I doing here? Um, yeah. And... Uh, I, I mean, I still remember walking into Diz's music room and 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 I didn't know they were going to be there. I right. thought maybe he's got this new young band and it's all, you know, whatever. We're, we work cheap. I, I, I ne never even discussed money with him. That's uh, and when you're young and eager like that, that's not something you really I'd never thought about it. So when I walk in there and and I'm coming in and they're already sitting around, I hear the piano and I look over and, and think, uh, I think that's Hank Jones. <laughs> I'm at the wrong place. And then James Moody, ironically, I knew him from that gig in Miami. He played a couple times and he, he was so excited to see me. He, I, I will say he made me feel comfortable and, and he made me feel validated that I'm in the right place. Um, and, and, you know, I've heard you play. I know, you know, Diz, you're gonna love this guy. And and for all I know, James uh, uh, Moody may have been res partly responsible for me getting the gig. Um, I, that I never never occurred to me to really ask him. But but he was so kind to me, even on the gigs we did in Miami. And 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 you know, I've got a picture of him literally kissing me on the cheek that people wow. people love. You know and uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll share some of the dizzy pictures and moody pictures and stuff like that. You could stick them in here somewhere if you want. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. That's great. Yeah, you've had, uh, as I said, an amazing career. You've worked with so many greats. What was it like working with Leonard Skinner? Well, that that's kind of a a um, a, and and I've tried to get that cleaned up in my resume. Leonard Skinner. Let me say this: one of a huge influence, and and now Victor. I turned Victor on to certain things that Leonard Skinner did, and he uses Leonard Skinner as examples of certain musical techniques that that he's been explaining through the funk world and through all of this. And I don't really I'll talk about that later, maybe on another episode. But Skinner is the only band that paid me quite a bit of money to not play with him what yeah and and i was I, I still lived in la but i was in myrtle beach i bought a house here in myrtle beach was spending time here and um um so i had a uh, i got called by the producer of an album kenny aronoff was playing drums on it mm -hmm. and uh, they said we need you to come you know i just worked with kenny on another project another album project and we had a great time and and uh and i was telling kenny uh he said i'm going to record with skinner and i said man one of my favorite bands i started listing all the songs and the bass lines from it and jamming and so when they were having a little bit of problem problem starting the album in in atlanta uh i got the call and i was literally packed up going to the airport to fly to atlanta and i got a call from producer saying that that Leon has shown up at the studio and everything seems to be okay today so we're just going to try tracking with him but just sit tight and uh 
and and uh, I thought, okay, I'll surf and play tennis and wait for the phone to ring, and I'll fly there tomorrow and start the album then. Anyway, that went on for two weeks, mm-hmm. and at the end of it, uh, they surprisingly, you know, Leon was having some issues, but was able to keep his stuff together, and ended up doing all the tracking and uh, and but they but they <laughs> and once again it was a record with Leonard Skinner. I never even thought about money, even though at that point in my career we did negotiate, but it never occurred to me that because I didn't play with him for two weeks, I was so excited to be at home surfing and playing tennis. Little did I know that the meter was running with Leonard Skinner. So basically I got paid for two weeks of tracking double scale, double sessions for two weeks and, and didn't play with them. And that, it's gotten it's not on my personal bio that i i recorded with leonard skinner but somehow Mm -hmm. that story has gotten leaked out and people leave out the part that that i i never actually played with him but they were my maybe my third favorite band my my second favorite band was jethro tull and right after that i did you did get to go over to london and spend a month in england making a record with ian anderson wow um the roots to branches album and it's so funny that through that era like right in, and then i i recorded a bunch with john anderson who was part of my favorite band yes oh, yeah. um, so i was i was hitting all like of my top five bands of 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 my youth i mm-hmm. got to actually record with them a, a couple decades later um but yeah ian and, and maybe you heard uh on my latest solo album carolina, carolina. but we did uh we re- redid beret from the stand-up album mm-hmm. and with just bass and flute and uh and yeah. ian's uh, you know it's one of these things i always tell people about building relationships it's they're they're only most of the artists i've worked with over the years have ended up playing on my albums years later, a lot of them, Um, especially this Carolina album. It's where I called in all my my uh, uh, favors of of a lot of people that I've worked with over the years, but I maintain relationships with them through the years. And that's what made them say yes. It wasn't uh, anything other than that. In fact, I'll I'll say this and, and a public thanks to all of you my heroes who played on that album and then when i went to try to pay you you wouldn't accept any money <laughs> i hear you steve yeah you know uh recording that uh that you were on you know uh the rippingtons i've always liked them and that tourist in paradise man i, I love that recording it's one of my favorites by them and uh, i think the late uh, singer carl anderson was on uh, one of those cuts the first cut that oh, was yeah. a great recording yeah yeah i still play that too and it sounds uh modern i mean i guess they made that in 89 or 88 or something like that but um yeah you, you're on that recording yeah that uh, was, go ahead sorry no no i was just going to uh, ask you what was it like working with them and uh because I, I think the tourist in paradise is probably their biggest one their biggest seller wasn't it yeah and it was my first album with them and uh, wow. i'll take complete credit for all of that no i'm just kidding <laughs> uh, when i moved to la i was the one reason I moved to LA and away from New York was I wanted to play more contemporary music. Uh, working mm-hmm. as great as working with Dizzy was and all of that, I was kind of in the jazz section of the store. And uh, uh, so moving to LA where I could surf again and every it just seemed like the right move. And I went out there and my first gig was with a guy named T. Lavitz, who's another University of Miami um, graduate who was in a band called the Dregs, the Dixie Dregs. And and uh and i i was getting heard around town with him on some gigs and i got invited to an audition for the rippingtons who were looking Mm -hmm. for a new bass player jimmy johnson one of my heroes yeah his first albums didn't didn't uh want to go on the road or you know he i always tell jimmy is one of my heroes i said man i made a great living just off the gigs you couldn't do and uh and i appreciate it so anyway, I, I, I auditioned for that gig and, and it was it was a, a, not a cattle call. They were all scheduled, but a lot of my heroes, everybody wanted that gig because they, they were just shooting up the charts and this mm-hmm. jazz stuff was, you know, Spyro Gyre, I will tip my hat to them as being the, 
the originators of it, but um, man, it was big business then. There were festivals and headlining events and in the Rippingtons, that, that album right before Tourist in Paradise, uh, I think it was Moonlighting or, or something like that, um, really shook people up and, and put that band on the map. So there were a lot of LA people who wanted that gig and, and not because I was better, um, but I did play fretless on all the stuff that Jimmy did. And, and I think I was the only person to audition to do that. And I, I went in really prepared. I studied the music. I absorbed it. I listened to it. Um, they knew I could read, but I, I didn't read. I didn't play like I was reading. Mm. Um, even when they threw a chart in front of me, I'd learned to interpret parts. And anyway, it was it was an amazing experience. I got the gig. I remember what it felt like. It was like when when I got the check my answering machine in New York and Dizzy Gillespie's voice was on there. I also remember, you know, Russ Freeman calling me up and going, Hey man, you're the cat. <laughs> the word he used it. You're the, you know, all those albums have the cat theme on yeah, it. And right. it just so happened that tourist in paradise, the theme was surfing. That's right. Yeah. And which, which is, which you're uh, an avid surfer, I you know, I am that guy. And if y'all Google, uh, Tourist in Paradise, um, the Rippingtons, we made one of the first jazz videos, big budget jazz videos. We filmed uh, this and it, they played it on VH1, but surfing is an integral part of it. And the whole beach vibe, which was just like, you know, right up my alley. Yeah. I was the only one in the band who actually went to the beach <laughs> and enjoyed the beach, but it sure looked like we all did. Yeah, that's beautiful. Steve, I wanted to ask you about a special person we've uh, been talking, whose name has come up a few times. How did you and Victor Wooten connect? How did you two meet? Because you guys have this incredible relationship that's lasted over 30 years and just the stuff that you guys have done together is amazing. I can attest to that because I just saw you guys in May. But how did you meet Victor and uh, how did that uh, collaboration start? Now tell me the name again. It sounds familiar. Who say that again? Victor Wooten. Victor Wooten. Hmm. Oh yeah, Victor Wooten. No, it, it's a uh, uh, touche, Victor. <laughs> Everybody always asks me, like a, a little aside. Um, but Dizzy Gillespie used to get po'd when people would come up and and the interview would be like the first question is, "What was it like playing with Charlie Parker?" Right. And, and I can tell you some funny stories of how Dizzy reacted to that. So I, I, I you know, flash ahead a few years. Um, a lot of times, pe the first thing people ask me, like, hey, man, what's it like playing with Victor Wooten? I'm going, you know, he's short like me. He's cool. But anyway, we met at a photo shoot and uh, it was a photo shoot. There were three bass players there. Uh, believe it or not, I was the one who was more established in this photo shoot. There was a new guy, a phenomenon named Victor Wooten, and there was another new guy who was in this band Primus that was just taken off named Les Claypool. Mm -hmm. And they they did a photo shoot for the amps. We all played the ADA amps. And uh, um, there's some cool photos of the three of us together, but that's the day I met Victor and... Uh, and we hung out. Uh, we couldn't play that day because like new model amps, they were all prototypes. They didn't actually work. And uh, which is a little tip on how the business works sometimes. But mm -hmm. later that year, we got together at a NAM show and uh, and we hit it off at that photo shoot. I mean, we talked about stuff and and it, it was cool. So when I saw him at NAM, everything was great. And uh, but we did get to play there. They gave us uh, each a half hour slot, Victor, a half hour, me, a half hour. And and uh, um, I, th I was thinking, man, I like the way Victor plays. Let's play together and then we get an hour. Mm. We combine our half hours and Vic always laughs at that is the way he could tell I had a business mind even at that point. It's like, how can we make the most of this situation? So we ended up playing uh, together and the first song we played was Sonny. And I knew it and he knew it and we just started jamming and this was the first time at a NAM show where I 
I call it the Nam Jam. And it, it's, it happens so much after that, but I'm talking about the jam of people in the, in the aisles. Mm. They heard two bass players playing that song together and me playing chords and moving down low and Victor up high and Victor tapping and me doing all these things that we still do naturally without really discussing them or, and all of that. It all happened naturally. And, and, uh, and so we played for an hour like that, played some blues, played all kinds of different things. And, and at the end of it, it was it really was remarkable that it all it just worked. We didn't. It's like I can't remember. Maybe it was Michelle Obama said uh, uh, when they go low, you go high or, or some. That, that's the way yeah. Victor and I play together. Like mm -hmm. when, when I go high, he he goes low and and we just stay out of each other's way and find a way to musically do it. And it's not something that we we planned or anything. It, it's just a, a simpatico that that uh, to this day, it's I, it's probably the reason that we're, that we're, st we're still playing together. I think we would always be friends, but we're still making music. And um, and through those years after shortly after that, I had this crazy idea of let's record it and convinced my publishing company at the time who'd put out my books, mm -hmm. instructional books, uh, to take a chance on us on a two bass thing with this young and up and coming guy, Victor Wooten. And they basically told me that that uh, uh, that nobody's going to buy a two bass instructional product and that they're not putting their money behind it. And uh, and I, I just wouldn't take no for an answer. So I, I negotiated all the way down to almost nothing, uh, no advance, basic recording costs. So we did the, the whole album. We wrote it in one day, mm. recorded it the next day, and we mixed it and did the instructional parts of it on the third day. And, and it was done. And uh, thankfully, it ended up being their best-selling bass product ever. And you knew. Sells. And, you knew, and, Steve, you had that intuition. You knew this is going to work. Well, I didn't. I did, I, I'd love to say I, yeah, I, I had confidence. I just <laughs> knew that it sounded good and that, yeah. and that Victor, I realized then that, that we get to a similar destination. Let's say, let's say we're going to go from LA to Nashville. Mm hmm there's tons of different ways to get there people will try to tell you there's there there's only one way to learn music and there's only one way to do this and one way to do that i'm thoroughly convinced that geography has taught me that there are a hundred ways to get from la to nashville you can fly you can take an interstate you can take the north route you can take the south route you can take the scenic route you can take route 66 you can sail a boat from la all the way around through europe and through the whatever canal you got to go through and come up to New York and then take a train from New York to Nashville. So there's a lot of ways to get there. Um, and, and they're all valuable in their own way. They all have their merits. And, and I teach like that. And, and I believed early on that Victor and I got to the same destination, but boy, do we do it differently. You mm -hmm. know, his tapping and, and the way he gets, notes that are not on his instrument are completely different than the way I get the notes that are not on my instrument and the way that he's able to on a four string uh, get the same polyphony and, and rhythmic things that it takes me six strings to do just tells me there's and we do things two different ways and there are 18,000 other ways to do the same things we do it's just that I knew that yeah that with his slapping and uh, and as popular as that was then and the way his method of doing it was it blew my mind like the stuff he could do with his thumb i thought you know let's put this in a book and make music of it so people can listen to the music and go wow that's cool music now how do they do that instead of the usual instructional video to this day where it's like oh here's my technique of doing this here's my technique of doing that and it we just wanted to do something that was music first and then here's how we did it and here's the routes that we took to get there Steve, i wanted to ask you about the six string uh dude amazing what you're doing on the six string is really unprecedented just some of the stuff that i saw you doing uh when i saw you at birchmere in may was just tremendous uh and i've 
you know, John Patitucci and several other bass players I've heard, but uh, what made you uh, start playing the six string? Was that just a natural progression for you or because really right now, no one plays that six string like the way you do. Well, thank you for that. And, and, uh, and thank God they don't. And that gets back to a conversation I had with Jocko where, where it, it but I'll tell it later. We'll do it on another <laughs> thing, but it, it okay. cuts straight to that when it gets back to, to why I play like I play. Mm -hmm. and, and I can say, Jocko, I guess he's a profound influence on me on what not to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, but anyway, I was uh, when I was playing with Dizzy, um, I had heard about somebody playing a five string bass. I hadn't actually heard it done yet. Um, uh, but I'd heard about a guy in New York and a guy in L.A. who was Jimmy Johnson mm -hmm. uh, playing a, a with something with a low B and I'd heard about Anthony Jackson playing with a low B in New York. And I was met a luthier up in Canada playing with Dizzy, met him in Vancouver. And I just said, can we build a five string bass with this low B? I've heard the strings are available. And he checked and said, yeah, I can buy a string that'll work on that. And I said, let's build one. And, uh, and he did. And I got it about four weeks later when I was playing in uh, Montreal and I got it and I took it out and I, it was, I still, I have that bass today. I lost it for years and I was able to buy it back a few years ago. And, uh, and I have that original five string fretless bass mm -hmm. and uh, um, I took it on the bandstand and, and I've got pictures of me on the bandstand with it, with Dizzy. Uh, but I took it on that night and just assuming I practiced a little bit with it in the, in the dressing room, I thought, man, this B is amazing. And we played a blues. First song with Dizzy was always uh, a blues um, and uh, uh, tenor madness usually or something, something like that. And nice medium tempo. And on this gig, I was only playing electric bass. We'd only taken electric. And he heard all these low notes go down and blues was in F and I could navigate that. And he turned around and he's hearing these low notes and looking around and and uh, and 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 then he goes one, two, three, four, five, like that. And he was like, wow, that's cool. The next song we played was Manteca. And and I was cool, but dee dee doo dee doo dee don't go gong. The bass line and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I was cool, but the bridge goes through all these different keys, these two five progressions in different keys. And and I got flustered like we do with a B string. And all of a sudden in my head, that was an E string. And then I, I, I screwed up the time. I, I mean, it, it, was, it was a train wreck of all train wrecks in the second song. And, and I felt like everybody was watching me. And, and I, I right-sized myself at the end of the bridge when it came back and got my composure back. But Diz comes back and whispers in my ear, uh, while somebody else is playing a solo. And he said, uh, you better learn to play that mother, you know what, before you bring it on my stage. Mm -hmm. and luckily, I had my four string and uh, my, my uh, the one I, uh, the, the, the fretless um, Stuart Spector that I ran over six months after I ran over my fretted one. That's part of the story you don't know. I ran over both of my Stuart Spectors. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but anyway, I, luckily I had that. And but I fell in love with the five string. I just decided I'm going to learn to play that B string as an equal to the others. And I so I started shedding it, practicing it like I'd, I would anything and uh, developed that. And once I got five feeling comfortable and I took it on stage with Dizzy a couple months later and and uh, that's all documented. Um, I'd speaking of John Patitucci, somebody had a pre-release version of Gotta Match. And it was even called something different then. And, and I heard John Patitucci playing those low notes and playing that melody up high. And I said, that's what I want is a six string. So I called the same guy in Canada. I said, let's do what we just did with the five, but let's add another high string on it. Mm -hmm. And within a, a month or two, I had that, that five string, I mean, that six string bass. And that was maybe 1986 at that point somewhere right around there. And then John and I met uh, shortly after that at a NAMM show. And I got m my first six string, which uh, was actually uh, a fretless. 
And I remember he saw it. Larave was there. And that's the first time Pat Atucci said, have you lost your mind? And he's told me that over the years, you know, when he hear, he would hear me play all these crazy chords and yeah. somehow they would be close to in tune. He goes, man, have you just lost your mind? Why are you making your life so difficult? <laughs> it could be so easy with frets. And, uh, That's you know, funny. Just, oh, man. But that, that, and then I never looked back. I mean, yeah. uh, I had uh, on the sessions I was doing in L.A., often the six string. I remember one time specifically speaking of John, where this producer said, hey, uh, when I pulled out the six string bass, he said, no, man, he goes, that's too much bass um, for this song. And and uh, uh, I had an old Fender P bass, which I still have a 50s P bass that I used mm -hmm. to use quite a bit, mm -hmm. still do. Um, so I, 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 I learned to play the right bass for the right music. And and not force feed my six string fretless or fretted or whatever on anyone. Um, I, I think, I think if I'm working for somebody else, my goal is to make them happy yeah. and give them what they want. So I end up, I'll play whatever you, you need and always have because, because you hired me, but given how weird it is for me to say, I'm more comfortable on a six string fretless bass than I am on a four string fretted. That's when John Patitucci says he, the brother has lost his mind. <laughs> that's, that's like, that's insane thinking, but it's true. I, I really yeah. am. And, and, uh, and I guess I'll take that to my grave. Cause I, I've got, I look over here, in my studio and there's like, uh, um, I don't know if, if, if you can, you can see over there, but there's those are all six string fretless bases. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Yeah. And my my fretted ones are over there. So I still keep them closer to me than the others. <laughs> awesome, man. That's so cool. Hey, I wanted to uh, ask you about uh, Berkeley. Uh, you uh, you're the chair there and you've been uh, for a little while now. What uh, what is that like? I mean, is that something you enjoy doing teaching? And I know, Victor, you guys work together and do some stuff there, but you uh, you're the man there. Well, uh, yeah, I, um, real quick story. In 1977, when I applied to Berkeley, mm -hmm. there was a, a chair of the base department there, and it was not nearly as large as he eventually grew it into. Uh, his, name, his name is Rich, Rich Appleman, and mm -hmm. he's kind of a legend in, in base education, always had the biggest base department in the world. And, and, uh, uh, but I didn't go to Berkeley uh, one reason was that I didn't get enough scholarship and I wow. couldn't afford to go. Yeah. And I made up my mind in 1977. I said, I'm going to have that guy's job someday. Really? I'm kidding. Uh, but, but I said it with a straight face like that to the president and a bunch of people right when I got the job and they thought, Oh my God, the, the Manchurian candidate is among us. He's been hatching this plan for, for decades. No, I, I never dreamed I would be at Berkeley. And 10 or 11 years ago, uh, I was made aware that that Rich was retiring. And and I read the, the job description. Everybody said, man, you, you this is a no brainer for you. You've got the academic background. You've mm -hmm. got um, teaching in the college background. You've got working at Victor's camp with curriculum and dealing with a lot of uh, other stars, which Berkeley is a place that's full of stars on the faculty and full of amazing uh, people. He said, you've got good people skills, apply for it. And I didn't want the job. Um, I like Myrtle Beach. I like uh, my artist in residency down here at Coastal Carolina University and doing right. gigs I wanted to do, but I wanted to see if I could get it. And, uh, and so I applied for it. And the next thing I know, I'm a finalist and I'm up there in Boston. And, and mind you, I still didn't really want the job. It intrigued me. Right. But the idea of leading a, a base department with 400 base students and, and 20 some faculty. And I mean, it, it's by 10 times larger than any other base department in the world. It tenfold yeah. but larger. I thought, yeah, no, and and uh, but I went up there for my final interview and presentation, 
and I met uh, one of the students, Aaron Lau, who's actually out there touring now and doing amazing things. But he he recognized me walking around by myself, just checking out the campus and and came over and, and asked me what I was doing in town. And I, I couldn't tell him what I was doing, but I said, I'd sure love to see Berkeley. And he said, let me show you around. And I went on the student tour of Berkeley, not the one that they want to give you to try to entice you to come mm -hmm. and the plan tour. But I went hanging with this student um, till the wee hours and the recording sessions, the jam sessions. And I mean, the place was just going nuts. And this was April of 2011. And it was going crazy there. And at the end of that night, uh, I decided I did want that job and went into the interview the next day and the presentation with that in mind. And um, next thing I know, there I am uh, getting um, getting a real dose in, uh, in all those things I, I previously mentioned, the size, the depth, the breadth of that department and the college, you know, with five, 6,000 music students mm -hmm. and, and you know, with faculty and chairs and and administrators, all with with heavy credentials, and it was great. And and I I thought maybe I'll do this for a couple of years, two or three years, and and see what what happens. And that was ten years ago, and I'm still uh, gainfully employed. And ironically. John Patitucci is one of uh, the base departments now visiting artists in residence, as well mm -hmm. as Victor Wooten. So mm -hmm. I got through serendipity and, and, and through their love of teaching and their expertise at it, uh, was able to augment my faculty, which already had, has amazing, uh, amazing people um, on the faculty. I was able to bring them in now regularly. We hang uh, every month for a week one fourth of every month is spent with both of them and and some of our recent hires like linda o is on the oh yeah and uh, for a while james genus was there and we've always had oscar St in fact one funny thing we have lincoln goins and oscar stagnero on the faculty and with me that's the entire lineage of pa paquito de rivera's bass players who've been with him the most i ironically i was the first one and then came lincoln for a while and then oscar yeah. We have Anthony Vitti, slap bass specialist, and Chris Laughlin from Brian McKnight's, Brian McKnight's band. Uh, on, I mean, it just goes on and on. We've got some faculty who have been there 44 years, and somebody like Linda who's been there two or three years. So I, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's like a family of being, sur everything, people have said, why don't you, go for a dean job or do something. And I said, no, I go, everything I do has the word base in it. Base curriculum, base faculty, base department, base office, base mm -hmm. students. I go, I'm gonna stick with what brung me to the dance. I love dealing with base curriculum of finding out ways, figuring out ways with my faculty, how we can dispense information in various ways to, to suit whatever's happening in the industry and to, to honor tradition and and make sure they have the fundamentals and and all the skill sets that they're going to need regardless of the situation in the world today that studios have changed and home recording and technology is important addressing all those issues this is a challenge not to mention this little thing called the pandemic that uh that got in the way of us all and yeah. uh, and some of us it blocked us and other of us, we just looked at it as this obstacle is part of my path, and let's figure out what we can learn from it. And I think mm -hmm. as a department, we fall into that latter category of, of there was some real innovation that has come about in the last couple of years um, as a result of not having any other choice. That's beautiful, man. And again, congratulations on that. You, uh, you're doing a, a fabulous job there. Uh, and, uh, you know, so many big names you, you mentioned, you know, Patitucci, Victor, Linda, um, you know, you guys just working together and learning from each other. It's wonderful. It's amazing. And, and, and all of those people, Linda, and there's a, a, John Patitucci helped me um, 
justify and and fill a job as a uh, with Susan Hagen, who mm -hmm. plays in the Boston Symphony and and is is one of the most amazing classical double bass educators. And it was important to me to have somebody like that on our yeah. faculty where students could go for fundamentals. But ironically, so many of them, Mike Pope, Whit Brown, they, they all ended up on this new bass extremes album that Victor and I have coming out because we recorded a lot of it in my office with John and with Vic and with Linda and with Susan, Mike. I mean, it's uh, and there's a lot of other artists on there, Ian and Willie Nelson and Ron Carter and all those yeah, and that, folks. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah Carolina, um, you know, your latest recording. I mean, all the names I was looking at, Mike Stern, Dennis Chambers, and I've had all these people on my show, Patitucci, Victor, they've all been on my show, but Man, what an incredible recording. And I'm, and you just mentioned earlier, you know, I had to call in some favors and I'm saying to myself, I said, this is pretty ambitious. You know, Steve's recording. He's got like everyone that you can think of on this recording. Like, wow. You yeah, know, that, that's on, on Carolina. Really yeah. And it's yeah. all duets. It's just Ooh. me and that one other person, whether it's it's Dennis is on there or Ron Carter or uh, Howard Levy. Yeah. Um, Becca Stevens on vocals. We do. Uh, that's the title track, Caroline in My Mind. And and yeah, that that and Willie, you know, Victor's favorite track is the Angel Flying Too Close to the Ground with Willie Nelson. And then Victor's on the next track called Shrimp and Grits, where he <laughs> sings the lyrics, which yep. is pretty funny. But yeah, I mean, it, but it's it's all about relationships. I was finally to a point in my life and career where I wanted to make that album like mm -hmm. I've made some earlier solo albums that were available in Asia and I got dizzy on one and Russ Freeman from the Rippingtons and David Benoit on it. So I've always been calling in favors. Larry Carlton's on mm -hmm. on a couple of my early records, but but I just I know it sounds kind of morbid in a way, but I I, I thought if I can make one more album. What will it be? And I thought, you know, I've, since I was a kid, I had this fantasy of being the accompanist, not just a bass player, but somebody who accompanies another singer or another instrument fully. So I supply the rhythm, I supply the harmony, and I supply the bass line and some melodies when needed. And if you really listen to this album, Carolina, it's 95% support of other people, of mm -hmm. of of Mike Stern of going, how can we do a crazy, much overdone Beatles song and make it something really cool or, or with Becca, you know, take a James Taylor song and make it work or, or with Ian, take a full yeah. on Jethro Tull song and make it work for, for just bass and flute. So it's, it's just one track of me and one track of them, no overdubs. And, uh, and, and I love it. I mean, I, I beautiful man. Yeah. I love what you did on it. That that's that's crazy. I mean, like I said, when I first saw it and I looked at the lineup, I'm like, wow. Because Ron Carter, that one jumped out at me. I'm like, this is the most recorded bassist in music history. And this guy's resume is unbelievable. I sat down with him. I did an interview with him and everyone from Thelonious Monk, Sonny Rollins, Miles, a tribe called Quest, Aretha Franklin. You can just go on and on. This guy's oh. played with everyone. It's unbelievable. Imagine how I felt. I mean, yeah. I was I've gotten to be good friends with with uh, sensei, as I call him out of respect over the years. Um, and and I I mean, I'm primarily known as an electric bass player and and but for some reason we've just hit it off and and. And I thought, you know, and it and we've become good friends academically and and socially and all of that, but still I remember the will you do this question where I was sitting and and the way I played it in my mind, like a proposal, you know, will you marry me? Will you will you consider doing a duet with me? It, it, I, I get nervous thinking about it. And uh, and I finally did it. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, and it and it all worked out. And and surprisingly with Ron, we recorded three pieces and only one of them's on the album. So there are two other sitting in the can, some other Bach that we made uh, uh, kind of interesting, different duets on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was 
when, awesome. I pitched, when I pitched it to Willie Nelson, he was like, well, he goes, I never sang with just a bass before, but you know, I'm known for trying anything once. So I guess we'll give it a shot, you know, and, and, and with the confidence of that, you know, I could ask other people like Ian and, uh, and, and have, uh, but I didn't expect everybody to say yes. I expected to have 12 tracks. That was my goal. And in the end, I asked 17 people mm-hmm. and I have 17 tracks. And that, mm-hmm. that kind of blew my mind. Everybody yeah. said yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, Steve, I just want to do one quick last segment here with you. Uh, it's a rapid fire question. I'm just going to name some bass players. Just say the first thing that comes to your mind. First name uh, that we're going to start with, James Jamerson. The Godfather. Okay, next name, Larry Graham. The other Godfather. I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, James, uh, Larry Graham. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, the Godfather. They, next there name. can be two Godfathers. There's That's different. Right. There's different families, but they're both right. godfathers. All right. Next name, Stanley Clark. Godfather. Next name, Anthony Jackson. See, I'm going to cry in a second because these, all of these are profound influences on me. And, and I think of them all as fathers to me, musically speaking. And, and, Everybody you've mentioned without them, I wouldn't be sitting here today. So they're all legendary godfathers in my mind. I mean, I could go into detail about what they contributed, but but the impact on me and and on what I do is keep going. Let, let's see if I can just finally say, oh, okay. yeah, he is great. Uh, yeah. Anthony Jackson. I mean, uh, uh, a godfather one who's taught me so much um by listening to him and by lately getting to know him and by the way on that carolina album there's a duet with anthony jackson that we wrote together Mm -hmm. that 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 is so beautiful so yeah i mean anthony's influenced so many people and and he's going through some challenges now and it's just amazing to see him bouncing back yet again and and with the bass in his hand Next name, Jaco Pastorius. Oh my God. So there's a guy, yeah, a godfather. I mean, uh, you're mentioning all the, the big Sicilian families here and, and thank God that nobody's fighting for turf because they've all had such a, they've had their piece of, of the pie. And, and I, I can't even say one is bigger than the other to me. They're all, you're, we're just dividing the pie into more pieces now, but it's still the same pie. And Jaco, um uh, most of the people you've mentioned have become friends of mine and Jocko was an early mentor who taught me so much about life about what to do and what not to do and and uh, yeah godfather next name jeff berlin um he's a godfather okay. um and and i won't and and i'm i'm jeff and i obviously a lot of people know about the history and for you to include him um, with those names should make him quite uh, be proud of that and and i'm proud you know i've known jeff for a long time and we see education so similarly yet he can't see it that way we agree on 95 percent of educational fundamentals. And yet Jeff wants to focus on the other 5% and not only dismiss what I do, but dismiss the work of Victor Wooten as being, well, I won't even go into it because, uh, uh, but he dismisses what we do educationally based on the three or 4% of what we do that he can't, he can't agree with. Um, I think that's that's sad because Jeff was a, a big influence on me, his music, the way he plays. Um, but academically speaking, um, 
I, I don't know why, I, I can't imagine why anybody would, would not want to be a colleague even with disagreements. And, and I've tried to bring Jeff into, into where we can sit down and talk about the 95% of what we agree on. But for whatever reason, um, that 5% is the only thing he wants to talk about. And that, that's sad. But like I said, the people, every Jocko taught me a lot about what I wanted to be and what I don't want to be. Mm -hmm. And I'll say even more that Jeff Berlin has taught me those same things. Some things I want to be, but a lot of, of uh, they call it ne negative education. And, and anybody who has, has had over the course of time that much negativity towards me and towards what we do, Victor and I do, and what, what a lot of other people do, frankly. It's not just, he just likes to single us out as, uh, as being the purveyors of, of all of this false information. I just say, you know, to anybody, the results speak for themselves. You can look around, make your own choice. I'm not telling you anything. I love Jeff Berlin. I still listen to his music. Um, uh, um, and maybe he, he, I'll put him in Godfather status with, with the others, but I just wish he would be part of our family and not, not, um, um, not a warrior and, and, and not a, um, divisionist, uh, a polarizing presence. And he could, he could, I'd love to have him as a teacher. I mean, I've told him that I just tell him that your teaching is not for everyone, but it, it would be for me. And, uh, and then, you know, the rest is kind of history. Yeah. Next name, Billy Sheenan. Oh, man. There's another innovator. I mean, I got to call Billy a godfather and a beautiful person um, who teaches me through what he says and what he plays and how he treats other people. And I can say that for, for almost everybody that we've talked about. They're, they're, they teach by what they say, what they put on social media, what they exude in their music. Um, yeah, Billy Sheehan, definitely. And he's on the new Basic Streams album. So, so many people on this new, it's called, um, I forget what the album's called. It's called Slow Down mm -hmm. and, and got a bunch of us old guys like Billy, not <laughs> slowing down much at all. But yeah, yeah Billy, Godfather. Next name, Mark Egan. Oh, man. Mark, now when you want to talk about influences, um, Mark Egan, to my ear, caught my ear after Jocko, especially his work with Pat Metheny over, over the years, and then his solo albums and his innovative, he, he's got his own sound and his own style. And I'll say this, is a beautiful person. Every time I see him, it smiles. It's positivity. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, well, yeah, Mark. Mm -hmm. Next name, Marcus Miller. Another godfather. Golly, you just, and a friend like, like the rest that, that exudes positivity, that, that, um, that brings a fresh look and sound every time he comes out with an album and mm -hmm. and another one of those just gracious gracious enough to write a song with victor and me and and ron oh yeah on the new album ron two godfathers together well three victor's a godfather to me and i know you're probably gonna drop his name eventually oh, of course you know it but, but the three of those guys together with greg bissonette and john patitucci on on the on the opening track of the album is amazing but yeah Marcus is, is one of my heroes. I don't play anything like him. I can't play anything like him. Um, and thank God for that, because I would, uh, I, he's got all that covered. Yeah, yeah. Next name, Richard Bona. Richard Bona is amazing. Um, uh, I don't know Richard that well. We've done a couple of things, but sound wise, um, what he brings from Africa is just unique. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, 
yeah, he's he's just a, a unique voice. I, I don't know him that well, but I, I hope I do get to know him well. Yeah. Next name, Victor Wooten. Oh, man. Um, to me, Victor is, well, uh, it, from a musical standpoint, I'll tell you, I've got a view of Victor Wooten, and it's not the obvious one of us being friends for decades and decades. But I, oh, since I've been at Berkeley, um, there have been hundreds, if not thousands, of bass players, young bass players, to show up at school. Um, hundreds and hundreds in our regular program, and then hundreds and hundreds more through our, our special programs. And if I had to single out one person whom most people cite as a reason that they play bass or a reason that they, they love music, it's Victor Wooten. Victor Wooten has influenced more, and, and, and believe me, I want them to say Ron Carter, but, but sometimes they come to Berkeley to learn about Ron Carter. Sometimes they, they come to Berkeley to learn about James Jamerson. Um, Victor Wooten has, has uh, I'd say over the last 20 years, probably has gotten the bass in more people's hands than, than anybody else. And then from there, you talk to Vic, he says, now go back, I stand on the shoulders of other greats, of Stanley, of Ron, of Marcus, who they're close in age, but Marcus was was Marcus was just a little ahead of all of us uh, in so many ways. Of, 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 uh, yeah. I mean, but Victor, you know, for us, it goes way beyond that. It's like, like you know, he he's my daughter's godfather. So, literally. I guess he would be the godfather um, because, you know, when Ella was born, I thought if, if I have to leave this planet, um, uh, there's the father I'd want her to have. That's beautiful, man. Steve, there's uh, one more name I want to add to the list. This guy's an exceptional bass player, uh, very humble, uh, wonderful cat. And uh, what he's doing on the instrument is unprecedented. And his name is Steve Bailey. And uh, you're a part of that history, that legacy, man. I love what you're doing. What you and Victor are doing are unprecedented. You know, I spoke with Stanley Clark a long time ago, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, Preston, he said, there's guys now that have much more technique than Jocko and myself. And I really feel like the two of you have taken the bass to a, a new level. You know, when I see, say, see him, I associate him with you and vice versa. So what you both have done is unbelievable and like i said that show that you guys did uh, at the birchmere was fantastic i was just telling some people if they come around you got to see steve bailey and victor Wooten. I said, oh, well, thank show. You. that was fantastic and uh just want to thank you man for being on jazz talk today you're a class act i've enjoyed our conversation hang on i'm about to close out the show well you've heard it from the great steve bailey and as the saying goes if the music grooves and makes you move it must be jazz I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace.